makes me treat you the way that I do. Gee, baby, ain't I good to you? Uh, let's move on to interpreting the Second Amendment. Uh, identifying the best policy to combat gun violence doesn't really do us much good uh, if we're constitutionally prohibited from implementing the best policy. So it's important that we look closely at the Second Amendment and see what it allows us to do. So before we attempt to interpret the Second Amendment, we need to lay some foundation. Uh, I don't want to have to explain all of this as I go, so I'm just going to lay it out uh, first so we can really dig into it when we start talking about the Second Amendment. Uh, let's talk about modes of interpretation. Uh, justices and judges approach the interpretation of statutes and constitutions with different basic philosophies. One approach that looks... Uh, uh, okay, one approach looks at legislative intent, uh, and this is the most traditional and widely accepted view. Uh, courts are to look at the legislative history behind the statute, or in our case, the amendment, uh, to give effect to the intent of the drafters. Interpreting an ambiguity in the text requires the courts to go beyond the text to look at the history and the public policy, uh, to make reasonable inferences about what the intent of the legislature was. Another popular approach is the textualist approach. Uh, approach. Now, textualism does not ignore legislative intent. Instead, textualism considers the statutory language uh, and the overall structure of the statute to be the best evidence of legislative in intent. The textualist rejects legislative history and public policy, and instead looks at the ru rules of statutory construction in order to resolve an ambiguity. Uh, textualists uh, construe an ambiguity consistent with these principles. One, that each part of the statute is presumed to have its own meaning and purpose or the legislator, legislature would not have adopted it. Two, that different parts of the statute should be construed individually so the whole makes sense. And three, uh, if the ambiguous word or phrase is used elsewhere in the statute, it should be assumed that the legislature used the word or phrase to mean the same thing in this context, absence evidence to the contrary. Got that? Okay. Uh, textualism is criticized for following this f formula to the bitter end, to the point of embracing absurdities. Um, there are other ways to interpret statutes in the Constitution, such as the realist or pragmatic approach, uh, which basically throws out uh, the structure of both the legislative intent approach and the textual, uh, textualist approach, and construes an ambiguity in the way that does the most good under the circumstances. Uh, I'm not going to deal really much with the realist or pragmatic approach because it doesn't really give us a lot of guidance in our task of interpreting the Second Amendment. So for our purposes, Legislative intent is always relevant. Uh, where intent is clear from the text, uh, it is unambiguous. And there is no need to really go beyond the text. You're not really interpreting. Uh, you're really just applying the text. Uh, now, where there are multiple reasonable interpretations of the text, the text is ambiguous, and we will need to construe the text in a way that, is mo that most reasonably gives effect to the intent of the drafters. Now, to do this, we have some help. We have some standard canons of interpretation. And uh, courts have a list of these sources of evidence that they use to determine uh, a reasonable interpretation of the text. These are considerations that are, are relevant in determining intent. There's, uh, of course, the language of the statute. That's always important. Uh, the immediate surrounding context of the statutory language the context of the entire act of which the statute is a part, the context of the entire universe of legislation, the general background and purpose of the statute, the statute's legislative history, canons of construction, uh, the consequences of different interpretations, and good social policy. Now, good social policy uh, is always considered the last, it's always the last thing considered, um, because generally courts don't like to be in the business of determining what is good social policy that is usually viewed as the province of the legislature. Canons of construction are mentioned. 
Uh, I'm going to go over a few of those real quick. We don't, uh, we won't use all of these, uh, but these are just some examples of what uh, is meant by a canon of construction. Um, there is uh, es judum generis, uh, which means of the same kind, class, or nature. With this canon of construction, whenever general words follow a specific word or specific words in a statute, um, in which several items have been enumerated, the general words are construed to embrace only the objects similar in nature to the objects enumerated by the preceding specific words of the statute. So basically, you, in the statute, you have a list of items. The first in the item is a general term, and it's followed by specific examples. Well, the general term, then, is construed as only applying to items that are similar to the, the more specific ones that are uh, enumerated. Another canon of construction is uh, unius est exclusio alterius, uh, which means whatever is omitted is understood to be excluded. And there are a lot of others. Uh, in the majority opinion in District of Columbia versus Heller, which is what we're going to look at later, Justice Scalia provides an additional rule for interpreting the Constitution, which is the words and phrases are to be given their normal and ordinary meaning as opposed to their technical meaning at the time of drafting. That's fine. No problem with that. That certainly might help us understand what the intent of the drafters was. It's an axiom of constitutional interpretation dating back to Marbur Marbury versus Madison that, it, uh, quoting, it cannot be presumed that any clause in the Constitution is intended to be without effect. So if it's in there, it apparently was intended to have some kind of effect. It's not wasn't intended intended to be idle. Uh, another canon is uh, noscitur a socius. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I'm not good with the Latin. Anyway, it means uh, read an ambiguous statutory term in light of its context. Simple enough. Um, I don't. Uh, have a problem with any of these sources or rules for interpreting the Constitution or statutes, they are all relevant. Uh, the text is always the anchor, and any good interpretation must begin with the text. Uh, beyond that, though, other forms of evidence of intent may uh, have different weight, uh, and they are not controlling in all cases, and um, all of them may be used to form premises in inductive arguments to support a particular interpretation as more reasonable than alternatives. Let's discuss some definitions uh, before we go forward. First, we're dealing with something uh, that's purported to be a right, the right to bear arms. So we should take a stab at defining what a right is. Uh, Black's Law Dictionary has a lot of uses, usages for the word right. Uh, the most pertinent, pertinent one is uh, quoting, something that is due a person by just claim, legal guarantee, or moral principle. The plur plurality decision in the case uh, that applied the Heller decision to the states, that case uh, declared that the right to bear arms was a fundamental right. So we need to define what a fundamental right is. Black's Law Dictionary defines a fundamental right as a significant component of liberty, encroachments of which are rigor rigorously tested by the courts to ascertain the soundness of purported governmental justifications. A fundamental right triggers strict scrutiny to determine whether the law violates the Due Process Clause or the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. As enunciated by the Supreme Court, fundamental rights include voting, interstate travel, and uh, various acts, aspects of privacy. If it's a fundamental right, then it triggers strict scrutiny. There's strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis. Most rights, however, fundamental or otherwise, any kind of right, um, they are not absolute. As Justice Holmes stated in American Bank and Trust Company versus Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, he said, most rights are qualified. Uh, and though Black's Law says that fundamental, a fundamental right triggers strict scrutiny, that's not exactly true. For instance, the Fourth Amendment uh, right to be secure, it says the right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. It's subject to a reasonableness test, not strict scrutiny. Uh, that's because the language of the amendment protects the stated interests only from unreasonable searches and seizures. So it's a reasonable test that applies, not strict scrutiny, even though that is a 
fundamental right. As I'll discuss later, the interpretation of the Second Amendment in Heller uh, virtually precludes the application of strict scrutiny to the so-called fundamental right to keep and bear arms. A strong, as strong a, a protection of fundamental rights as strict scrutiny is, even if it had strict scrutiny, um, it's still not absolute. Um, a strict scrutiny can be and has been overcome by statutes that are sufficiently narrowly tailored to serve a compelling state interest. So even if the Second Amendment had strict scrutiny applied to it, that still would not make it an absolute right. So let's look at reasonable interpretations of the Second Amendment. With the foundation that we've already laid, we're ready to look at uh, D.C. versus Heller. We're going to uh, learn uh, about interpreting the Constitution by uh, looking at the majority opinion in D.C. versus Heller, um, written by Justice Scalia, and uh, one of the dissents written by Justice Stevens. And by examining those, we will understand more about interpreting the Second Amendment. Okay, the majority opinion in Heller. Uh, the facts of the case, basically the D.C. Code made it a crime to carry an unregistered firearm uh, prohibited, it prohibited re registration of handguns, and it required uh, legal weapons to be inoperable in the home, such as by use of a trigger lock. Procedural history on that, um, the, second, uh, the D.C. Circuit said this, the Second Amendment protects individual, an individual right to possess firearms, uh, and a, the ban on handguns and the trigger lock requirement uh, were unconstitutional. Justice Scalia, as I said, wrote the majority opinion um, of the case when it got to the Supreme Court. Scalia looks at the plain meaning of the words of the amendment, as any good textualist should. Um, in doing so, he sees that the amendment is divided into two parts. Uh, the first part he labels as the prefatory clause, and the second part he uh, calls the operative clause. Uh, and he says that the former does not limit the latter grammatically, but rather announces a purpose. So the prefatory clause uh, says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. According to Scalia, after analyzing the operative clause, we return to the prefatory clause to ensure that the interpretation is consistent with that purpose. Now, the operative clause says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Scalia delves into, the, uh, into analyzing the words right of the people, uh, looking at how the phrase is used elsewhere in the Constitution. Uh, he notes that the militia is a subset of the people, and reading the amendment as protecting a right only in the militia context fits poorly quoting uh, Scalia here, fits poorly with the operative clause's description of the holder of that right as the people. Scalia then looks at the uh, language keep and bear arms. To define these words, Scalia departs from the Constitution and delves into secondary authority. He looks at old dictionaries. Uh, he even looks at a legal dictionary, which would provide a more technical meaning for the words than their normal ordinary meaning, but We'll forgive Scalia this time. One important uh, point that is asserted uh, uh, is that the Second Amendment uh, codifies a pre-existing right. The Second Amendment didn't create the right, it codified a right that already existed. Since uh, Justice Scalia sees the right as pre-existing, he looks at the history surrounding private ownership of arms in England before the founding. And as noted earlier, the textual textualist approach uh, to statutory and con constitutional construction eschews legislative history uh, as evidence of legislative intent. And so for that reason, uh, Judge Posner pointed out that Justice Scalia's digging into the history surrounding the Second Amendment is kind of like doing legislative history, which textualists say that they don't do. Uh, now, this criticism... Uh, caused Scalia to go ape shit, and he lashed out at Judge Posner. Uh, but uh, whether Posner was right or not, the process by which Scalia reaches his decision here in this case does seem to be incons inconsistent uh, 
uh, with uh, Scalia's interpretive axioms. Okay, so Scalia looks at other sources of history. He looks at 18th century state constitutions which enshrined the right to, uh, quote, bear arms in defense of themselves and the state, or, quote, bear arms in defense of himself and the state, as it says in some state constitutions of the time. Now, if these state constitutions are codifying the same pre-existing right uh, as the Second Amendment, then the right to use arms for self-defense must be included in the Second Amendment. This gives Scalia permission to read in self-defense as a purpose of the Second Amendment, even though there is no whisper of such pur purpose in the text. Scalia interprets the phrase security of a free state to mean security of a free polity, not the security of the several states of the United States. Uh, he cites the phrase as being a term of art used in the 18th century. Uh, this is a strained interpretation in my view, and it contradicts one of our canons of interpretation, which says that uh, you're supposed to read an ambiguous statutory term in the light of its context. And there's nothing in the surrounding text that suggests that a state in this uh, amendment means polity and not one of the several states of the United States. Uh, further, as the case, uh, the DC Circuit case, Parker versus District of Columbia states, um, quoting, the Constitution uses the term state or states 119 times apart from the Second Amendment and in 116 of the 119, the term unambiguously refers to the states of the Union. Uh, Scalia is really stretching here. Most likely the word state in the Second Amendment means state. Scalia hedges on his assertion of an individual right in the Second Amendment because he, he says, quoting, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions uh, on the possession of firearms by felons, and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government building, buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. Even if his methods are off, there is nothing inherently unreasonable about seeking evidence of legislative intent in the history surrounding the creation of the amendment. Uh, I may not agree with Scalia's methods or his conclusions, but uh, I would say that his interpretation is reasonable. However, that doesn't mean that there might be, might not be other interpretations that might be more reasonable than Scalia's. A more reasonable interpretation might be one that accounts for the text and the history, but also addresses some other important concerns like precedent, like the broader context of the amendment within the rest of the Constitution, uh, Scalia's incorporation of history into his interpreta interpretation also it reads something into the amendment that is not present in the text, the application of the right uh, to keep and bear arms uh, for the purpose of self-defense. Self-defense is never mentioned in the in the text and so the process that he uses basically it adds it. It adds something that's not there. So to the extent that we can interpret the, the amendment without adding something that's not there, we should probably prefer to do that. So let's look at Justice uh, Stevens' dissent in Heller. A lot of uh, Stevens' dissent is a criticism of uh, Scalia's majority opinion. So Stevens basically makes his point, and it, he does make positive points, but he makes it uh, oftentimes through the method of criticism of the majority. Justice Stevens thinks that Scalia is answering the wrong question. The question is not whether the First Amendment protects an individual or collective right. He, uh, Stevens says, surely it protects a right that can be enforced by individuals. But a conclusion that the Second Amendment protects an individual right does not tell us anything about the scope of that right. Uh, there is clarity on the two extreme points of the scope. So uh, there is definitely no right to bear arms, for instance, to rob a bank. But there is definitely is a right to use arms for certain military purposes uh, in the militia context. But between these two poles, there's a lot of gray area. Uh, so does the right 
encompass the use of firearms for non-military uses such as hunting and self-defense. That's in this gray area and that is the question that the court needs to answer. Uh, now Stevens uh, looks at history too, uh, but he has a different view of history than uh, Scalia does. In Stevens' view of history, the Second Amendment was a reaction to the fear of the federal government creating a standing army, which was viewed as intolerable to state sovereignty. Now this is an important distinction from Scalia's reading of history because it means that the founders need not have intended to include the purpose of self-defense in the Second Amendment even if that purpose was part of a right that existed before it was, it was codified in the Constitution. Stevens also interprets the Second Amendment in light of precedent. Uh, he points to the case of U.S. versus Miller, which was decided back in the 1930s. That case says, quoting, In the absence of any evidence tending to show that possession or use of a shotgun having a barrel of less than 18 inches in length at this time has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say that the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. What about this conspicuous absence of self-defense or hunting in the prefatory clause? Stevens addresses this. He says, no new evidence has surfaced since 1980 the last time the Supreme Court decided an important gun control case, uh, supporting the view that the amendment was intended to curtail the uh, power of Congress to regulate civilian use or misuse of weapons. Indeed, a review of the drafting history of the amendment demonstrates uh, that it, its framers rejected proposals that would have broadened its covered, uh, coverage to include such uses." End quote. Stevens goes on to say, Quoting, even if the textual and historical arguments on both sides of the issue were evenly balanced, respect for the well-settled views of all of our predecessors on this court and for the rule of law itself would prevent most jurists from endorsing such a dramatic upheaval in the law. The preamble, Stevens says, has three points. One, the amendment, amendment's purpose is to preserve the militia. Two, the militia uh, is necessary to the security of a free state. And three, the militia must be well regulated. Now these points are taken uh, from the text itself without reading anything into the text that isn't there, like self-defense. Now even if you disagree with how uh, Stevens frames these three points that uh, he takes from the preamble of the Second Amendment, uh, at the very least, they do come from the text. It, it's not reading something in that isn't there. Now, about the comparison with state constitutions, which is something that Scalia made a point about this, uh, Justice Stevens notes that the very fact that the Second, Amend Second Amendment is worded differently than contemporary state constitutions points to the drafter's awareness that the Second Amendment would have a different effect. Uh, he says, the contrast between the state constitutions and the Second Amendment reinforces the clear statement of the purpose announced in the amendment's preamble. It confirms the framers' single-minded focus in crafting the constitutional guarantee to keep and bear arms was on military uses of firearms, which they viewed in the con context of service in state militias. Now, I would like to add that one of our canons of interpretation uh, unius est exclusio alter alterius, uh, which is whatever is omitted is understood to be excluded, ought to apply here. And the uh, right to use keep and bear arms for the purposes of self-defense uh, was, I think, consciously omitted from the text of the Second Amendment, and uh, it should be understood to be excluded as part of the right. Uh, also, the construction that Scalia gives to the preamble uh, in the Second Amendment fails to apply one of our uh, canons of construction uh, for the Constitution, which is that no clause in the Constitution is to pres be presumed uh, to be without effect. The mo majority opinion's construction uh, treats the text of the preamble as Stevens views as a mere surplusage that would cause, cause the preamble to be without effect which violates one of our canons of construction. There's also a problem with the limitations that the majority places on the amendment. For instance, it, the majority says the 
right does not extend to you know, long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons, the mentally ill, laws forbidding carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools, government buildings, laws imposing conditions, qualifications on commercial sale of arms. Majority says that the right doesn't extend to those things. But where do these limitations come from? They would not apply to any other fundamental right in the Constitution. There's no such limitation on the class of persons protected by the First and Fourth Amendments. When Scalia is announcing this interpretation, it's not just a new interpretation of the Second Amendment. This is a novel concept of rights. It is the announcement of an individual and is later defined as a fundamental right, but with these categories to which it simply doesn't apply, and there doesn't seem to be any principle for why it doesn't apply to those uh, categories. Stevens also sees, uh, has a different construction of the meaning of the uh, words keep and bear arms. He says that the most natural meaning uh, of these terms is military. Um, and he says that the preamble of the Second Amendment con confirms this interpretation. So after looking at a couple of wildly different views of the Second Amendment and how it should be interpreted, um, let's look at what the decision in Heller and later McDonald actually mean. Um, because that is the law of the land. Whether you agree with the majority opinion in Heller or not, that is the law right now. So what does it mean and what does it not mean? First of all, it means the Second Amendment protects a right uh, that includes uh, or would make unconstitutional anything that uh, any law that bans um, firearms in the home for self-defense. So you have a right to have a firearm in your home operable, not with the trigger lock, for the purpose of self-defense. That is what Heller says. But what does Heller not mean? First of all, Heller does not mean that all gun control laws are illegal. Uh, in fact, Heller spells out very specifically some categories where gun control laws are presumptively legal. What Heller does not do, though, and what is awfully uh, hard to figure out from the text, is what level of scrutiny should be applied to the individual and fundamental right that they've found here in the in the Second Amendment. Should it be strict scrutiny? Should it be intermediate scrutiny? Should it, should it be rational basis? Well, for that, um, I turn to uh, law review articles. And uh, there was one that I thought was really good and gave a good um, analysis of this issue. Um, it's a, an article by Stephen Keel, uh, the title of which is in Search of a Standard, Gun Regulating After Heller and McDonald. I'm just, just going to sum it up here. Basically, uh, courts are starting to settle, when, when they're having to apply Heller, they're settling on intermediate scrutiny as the level of scrutiny to apply to uh, gun control laws. Intermediate scrutiny means that um, a law can only survive constitutional review if it um, is substantially related to an important state interest. It is not a high standard as strict scrutiny which normally is applied, as we said, to fundamental rights. But the reason that the courts are interpreting it that way is because the categories that are described in Heller, which are uh, gun laws that are, uh, gun control laws that are presumptively legal, those would not survive strict scrutiny. Stri strict scrutiny is just, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have that, those categories. It, it wouldn't work. Um, on the other hand, rational basis, which is the lowest level of scrutiny applied on these constitutional issues, is not a high enough level of scrutiny for a so-called fundamental right. So you need something higher than um, rational basis, but strict scrutiny would be inconsistent with the decision in Heller, so what you're left with is intermediate scrutiny. Regardless, though, of what level of scrutiny is applied, gun control laws are almost universally upheld even after Heller. Uh, you're hard-pressed to find a gun control law after Heller that has been struck down as unconstitutional, regardless of what standard the court applies. So, what does that leave us with? What that means is that if we determine that a certain method of gun control is more effective 
uh, or is, is fairly effective in reducing gun violence, then the Second Amendment doesn't really prohibit us from taking that action unless it violates that core right as, ex as expressed in Heller. That gives us a pretty broad range of activities that we can do in restricting firearms without violating the Second Amendment. That is the, the best I can do as far as educating you on how to interpret the Second Amendment. Um, I know that there's, uh, there are uh, gun control proposals out there. Uh, the question of whether or not they'll be effective is outside the scope of this video. Um, thanks for watching. It's turned out to be a pretty long video. Um, it'll take me a while to get it up. I've got to put all the little citations in there so that I'm not plagiarizing. Uh, and I guess I will talk to you all later. Bye. Love makes me treat you the way that I do. Gee, baby, ain't I good to you?